Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this uh, CGU. Um, uh, what, are we, what is this? Uh, this is a um, conference presentation. Um, so this afternoon, we have a general hydrology session, and we have six presenters. Um, and we're going to have sort of 12-ish minute talks, and I'm strongly encouraging people to ask questions. Um, I will relay the questions to the speakers. If you can use the Q&A feature um, to, to write down your questions, that would be excellent. Um, I'm advising you that we have um, closed captioning available, if that's of interest or use to you. So um, it should be I think uh, clear how you do that. There should be a, a button on your on your screen if you wish to enable the closed captioning. I should introduce myself. I'm Andrew Ison. I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, we have a good number. We have 30 attendees now. That's a nice number. Um, I think we span um, the entire of Canada from east to west. So so fantastic. So with no further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, who is Cody Ross from the University of Manitoba, and he's going to be talking about uh, hydrologic thresholds at the catchment scale. Can 3D representations help? So hopefully we can hand over seamlessly now to Cody. Okay, hello everyone. Can you, can I be heard right now? Yeah? You can, yes. Okay, perfect. I'll just get started right away. So um, today I'm going to be discussing nonlinearities in catchment response and whether or not three-dimensional representations might be useful for better understanding threshold behavior. So first, I'd like to offer a rationale for a growing interest um, in emergent. Cody, Cody yes? are, you, are you supposed to be sharing a screen at this point? Oh, yeah. Is it not showing? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, one second here. Yeah? Yeah. You might want to just go back to the first slide quickly and then. Okay. Excellent. Okay, perfect. So there's my uh, title slide. I'll just move on here. So um, first I would like to offer a rationale for a, a growing interest in emergent properties. So uh, much of the research in hydrology has focused on fine scale process descriptions for individual hill slopes or catchments. So these studies have greatly advanced our understanding of runoff generation processes. However, there's heterogeneity in climate, geology, vegetation, soils, and geography. And um, this has been coined by Keith Bevan as the uniqueness of place. And this is inherent to isolated studies. So this reality makes generalizations across sites difficult. And um, it's kind of motivated increased interest in emergent properties that reflect landscape heterogeneity and process complexity. So hydrologic thresholds, particularly hydrologic thresholds that are of rainfall runoff relationships are one of those emergent properties. So um, this type of threshold is defined as a critical moment in time or a point in space coinciding with a significant change in runoff behavior. So the input output scatter plots that are shown in the center of this slide highlight the type of thresholds that have been reported in the hydrology literature. So most commonly um, accounted threshold behavior is described using hockey stick shape thresholds. And increasingly, these different thresholds are being used to characterize and compare hydrologic response. So threshold behavior at the scale of hydrologic events is typically evaluated using these two dimensional scatter plots like the one shown here. So these scatter plots show an input meteorological factor and an output response metric on the y axis. So um, each point on the scatter plot is associated with a single rainfall runoff event. So most commonly thresholds are evaluated using output response metrics that include the total event runoff, peak discharge and the runoff ratio. Um, likewise for meteorological factors, the focus has often been on factors that are related to storage based processes. So total event rainfall is most commonly used. Um, in other studies, there's been a combination of total event rainfall with soil moisture indices as well as water table levels. Uh, a much smaller number of the threshold-based studies have focused on um, factors that are related to intensity-based processes like rainfall intensity. So this disparity between factors related to storage processes and, fa and factors related to intensity processes is largely because of where most hydrologic studies are carried out. And that's typically in temperate, humid, forest environments. And these studies are less common in more arid environments or areas with lower infiltration capacity. So 
regardless of the input meteorological factors that we consider, a 2D evaluation like the ones described previously um, using scatter plots only consider a single meteorological factor. So this perpetuates the notion that this nonlinear catchment response that's commonly observed can be explained by a single factor. When we evaluate uh, eco-hydrological process conceptualizations, there are many processes that influence catchment response and they're affected by storage and intensity processes simultaneously or by storage and intensity process interactions. For example, on the left, we see classic representations of runoff generation mechanisms. Uh, on the top one, in the case of Hortonian overland flow, this type of response is induced when the infiltration rate is exceeded by rainfall intensity. In a similar way with saturation excess on overland flow, when an area is saturated, the rainfall intensity plays an important role in subsequent response dynamics. Um, when we consider the vegetation stand scale, rainfall intensity, evaporation, and antecedent canopy storage, they determine if and when canopy interception capacity is exceeded. And this controls the net rainfall that reaches the ground and that subsequently triggers different runoff generation mechanisms. So you can see that there are reasons to believe that multiple different factors are likely controls on nonlinear responses that are commonly observed at the catchment scale. So despite this, there's a disconnect between the processes that we are observing and how we evaluate thresholds in hydrology. So if there, there have not been robust um, simultaneous multi-factor analyses on hydrologic thresholds. Um, this type of analysis is actually very com common in other disciplines. So multi-factor analyses on ecological response is regularly assessed, and that's using um, three-dimensional response surfaces usually. Um, similarly, in other disciplines like mathematics, statistics, and engineering, response surfaces are commonly used to evaluate system response to multiple factors. So here, our general goal was to borrow some of those techniques from other disciplines and use them in hydrology. So this leads to our research question, which is, do interactions between storage and intensity-based processes lead to the emergence of threshold behavior in hydrologic response? So in this study, the focus was on eight subcatchments of the Maharangi River catchment in New Zealand. Um, and those um, catchments, they range in drainage area from about 0.5 kilometers squared to 25 kilometers squared. It's a relatively humid climate there. And um, these catchments primarily have a land use that's rangeland and forested. So the rainfall runoff events um, that were used in this study were delineated from five-year records of rainfall discharge and temperature. And that was done using the Hydron toolbox in that lab. So event response for each of those events was characterized using the total event runoff and then um, event specific meteorological factors that reflect storage based and intensity based processes were derived. So volume factors related to storage based processes included the um, event total rainfall and the sum of um, rainfall plus seven day antecedent rainfall. Um, the intensity factors that we considered here were the average rainfall intensity over the event, per event period and the antecedent potential evapotranspiration over the same seven day um, antecedent window. So from these data with the um, storage based factors and the intensity based factors, three dimensional response surface is were uh, modeled using locally weighted polynomial regression. So this type of regression, it approximates the underlying function of nonlinear relationships, but it doesn't utilize a single function across the entire domain. Um, so this is a popular smoother and it's been used in change point analysis for water quality data. And it's also been used to um, estimate changes in lake volume. So since our focus was on interactions or effects from storage and intensity based processes, 32 response surfaces um, were modeled to illustrate um, total runoff as a function of both one volume factor and one intensity factor. So we only considered response surfaces that had a moderate to strong um, fit with the observed data. Mm -hmm. So response surfaces are represented as contour plots in this study um, as the effect of both the volume based and intensity based factors on response can be interpreted from the contour line geometry. So the modeled response services, um, they exhibited a lot of variability in the contour line shape across the entire surface. So we separated the surfaces by quadrant to kind of facilitate or, or make evaluation easier. So these contour plots, um, they were used to interpret factor effects on response. So in terms of how to interpret um, the contour line shape, um, contour lines that are straight and oriented perpendicularly to a single axis, those illustrate response that's influenced by a single factor. 
and that's called the main effects. Um, straight vertical lines are main effects of a storage factor and straight horizontal um, lines are main effects of an intensity factor. So in contrast to that, um, there's curved contour lines and they indicate interactions between those different factors. So contour plots were classified based on their dominant contour line shape, so straight or curved. And this just allows for quick comparison across different relationships and sites. So in terms of the distribution of those dominant contour line shapes across the response surface quadrants, we did this in, in aggregate across the 32 surfaces. So in general, what we saw was total runoff was affected by volume intensity factor interactions um, in all surfaces and all quadrants. So that's evidenced by the presence of, of curved contour lines. Um, these factor interactions, they were dependent on the range of meteorological factor values that were considered, and that's why there's differences in their dominance between different quadrants. So factor interactions were most common in quadrant one, and this might imply that those factor interactions are strongly um, present when both volume and intensity factors are low. Um, conversely, in quadrant two and four specifically, um, they were more frequently classified as, as straight in addition to those curved ones. So those two quadrants, they have one low factor value and one high factor value. And that might, might be why there was more scenarios that were controlled by a single factor indicated by those straight contour lines. So the differences between straight and contour um, line dominance in quadrant three were less pronounced. And that makes predicting um, control factor dynamics um, more difficult. So notably, all of those quadrants that were dominantly straight contour lines, they were oriented vertically. And that indicates dependence on a storage based factor. There wasn't a single case where um, it was influenced dominantly by an intensity based factor. So the relative importance of straight and contour curve lines um, across those surfaces, they lead to different types of gradients. So we have three different types of gradients that were observed throughout this study. First, the linear gradient, second, the angular, and then last, the radial gradient. So linear gradients, they show um, basically responses that increase progressively from low to high along a single axis. Angular gradients, they illustrate response that increases with both factors. And then radial gradients show hot spots of elevated response. So the percentages in the top right corners of those plots indicate how regularly those types of gradients were observed across the studies. Um, so these different gradient types um, have implications for predicting the response that are associated with these surfaces. So response pre predictability is highest for linear gradients um, and mostly straight contour lines are present. And that's just because of the dependence on a single factor. For angular response gradients, predicting response is a little bit complicated. That's because you have to determine the orientation of the gradient um, as well as the geometry of the gradient. And then similarly for predicting hotspots, it's challenged because the, uh, it's unknown where the location of the hotspot or the geometry of the hotspot is. So um, that's actually a very similar um, problem to um, lo local or global maxima problem in identifying parameters and parameter space for hydrologic modeling. So response services, um, they also show that thresholds in response for multi-factor relationships are different than those in 2D scatter plots. So in 3D thresholds, um, the changes do not correspond with individual moments in time as seen on the left scatter plot. Um, rather thresholds on the surfaces correspond to planes or lines along discontinuities in contour plot color. Um, so we refer to that as threshold fronts here and they're indicated in those yellow lines. So this too has implications. So for each threshold front, there are a number of different combinations of factor values that might coincide to um, changes in response. So um, the, the length of those response, or sorry, the length of those threshold fronts might be associated with the number of um, combinations that are associated with response changes. And the complexity of the front geometry might indicate how difficult it is to predict when or where that response change is going to occur. So those types of things are things that should be evaluated um, using synthetic data or um, data that's um, from a broader data set. So I'll, I'll just conclude with this, those findings that I was discussing with some remarks about what we know from this research about thresholds in three dimensions, and also some areas of op opportunity for future work. So the things that we know, number one, is that um, this approach where we consider multiple factors is consistent with process conceptual conceptualizations. So assessing thresholds as a function of multiple factors 
is aligned with those process concept conceptualizations that I mentioned earlier. So we also observed non-negligible factor interactions. So they were observed at all sites and all quadrants, and they were associated with changes in hydrologic response. Um, we also observed complex threshold fronts, and those th um, that means that thresholds may exist at several combinations of critical volume factor and intensity factor values on a single response surface. So for future work, this suggests that threshold assessments should likely consider multiple factors that are associated with different processes. And it's also clear that a new method for detecting threshold that emerges from interactions between multiple factors is, is needed. And that this would be um, helped by um, different ways of formulating comparisons be between thresholds that are based on how significant or abrupt changes in response actually are. And with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge the New Zealand National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, um, as well as Andrew Western, Ross Woods, Hillary McMillan, and Kathy Walters for providing data for the Maharangi River catchment, as well as I'd like to acknowledge my um, advisors, Dr. Genevieve, Genevieve Lee and Chris Spence. Thank you. Thank you, Cody, very much. Okay, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, the first is from Tyler Hampton. He says, so for the 3D response surface, how do you visualize confidence, e.g. the island on the right-hand side of quadrant one? Is there a, coinc is there, is there a confidence in these curved features? Um, so the, in, in a way, the actual identification of the threshold location is just based visually in the same way that a lot of 2D thresholds are observed within a visual context. Um, in terms of the data that's used to construct the surfaces, um, we only include um, surfaces that meet uh, specific criteria for fitting the regular data. Um, and you would notice in the surfaces that there's areas that are kind of grayed out. Those are areas where there's a, a lack of data and a surface could not be adequately predicted. So the um, confidence that you predict a surface and subsequently identify a threshold from largely depends on the density of the point data that is using to model the surface. Okay. Um, now we've got a question from Claire Oswald. Can you explain mechanistically how a PET7 is an intensity factor? So um, the APT7, so anti-team potential evapotranspiration over the seven day period is measured as a depth or as a volume, but it's directly associated with a um, intensity based process, that being the intensity of solar radiation. So um, the intensity based um, factors that we're considering aren't necessarily related to rates of water addition or removal in terms of their um, actual units of measure, they can also be related to a storage or intensity-based process. So in this case, the intensity-based process is the intensity of solar radiation. So you're saying that intensity, you're defining intensity as a, as a rate? Um, it can be a rate like rainfall intensity, for example. So the rate of water addition, or it can be a factor that's related to an intensity-based process. Okay. Um, Claire had a second question, which was, how do you identify a threshold front? So in this case, um, the threshold front is a visual discontinuity in response. So um, the steepness can be um, assumed from the closeness or proximity of multiple contour lines. Um, something that wasn't shown in this presentation was also a metric that was used to identify nonlinearities in the response surface, and that's called threshold strength. And that threshold strength metric is commonly used in ecology. And in that context, it measures actually the um, changes in monotonicity or bimodality in the response surface. And it's standardized. So when it's a non-zero value, it indicates that there's a threshold on the surface. But the actual specific locations is still just a visual identification in this context. Okay. We've got one more very quick one um, from Nicholas Kanar. Cody, thanks for the interesting talk and the pedagogic, pedagogical sections on thresholds. How do you relate intensity and volume to multiple variables? Are the variables related using polynomial models? Um, so in some cases, so are the intensity and um, storage based factors related? So sometimes there are correlations between the amount of rainfall that's observed in an event and the intensity of rainfall that's observed in an event. So there can be um, some interaction 
well, not interactions in the sense that I was talking about, that there could be some confounding factors in that case. Um, uh, in this particular um, site, there is a moderate um, correlation between the intensity of rainfall and the volume of rainfall. Um, I'm also conducting similar analysis for other sites that don't have those um, same, same correlations. Okay, well, that's excellent timing, Cody. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great talk. So I'll, we'll, we'll go to the next speaker, which is Anna Chesnikova, and we're going up to the Yukon to talk about glacier retreat and hydrological change. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm just going to take a second. Okay. So, uh, well, thanks everyone for being here, first of all. And um, I'll be talking today about linking uh, mountain glacier retreat and hydrological changes. And I wanna start with this uh, image here. This is Athabasca Glacier in Alaska, and this is its retreat uh, during the last uh, uh, few decades. And I'm sure all of you have seen similar images for different parts of the world. And this is because um, under climate change, this is our current day reality. And in this reality, uh, one of the major challenges in hydrology would be predicting changes in uh, freshwater flows and storage resulting from this, from this uh, glacier retreat. And um, why do we want to tackle this challenge is because uh, in mountainous regions, glaciers, they harvest uh, precipitation during the winter and then they release them during the summer, thus acting as water towers uh, in the areas. Also by changing uh, temperature regime and uh, sediment flux downstream, they create some special habitat for local species. And that's both understanding and being, being able to mimic the change of these systems um, in the context of climate change is important for water resources management and ecosystem services. However, on a watershed scale, uh, identifying the direct link between uh, glacier dynamics and measured hydrological changes is uh, still challenging. Uh, traditionally, it is done with two different approaches. Uh, first one is historical data analysis. So we perform trend detection on a measured uh, meteorological time series. So this approach provides a reliable estimate of uh, recent changes in real measured discharge variables, but uh, it's kind of hard to perform trend attribution um, uh, and often it's done uh, based on qualitative reasoning when we, for example, compare results of trend detection for glaciers and non glaciers watersheds. The second approach is numerical modeling. And uh, unlike the first one, it makes it possible to study the main drivers of model hydrological changes. But uh, disadvantage is that, of course, model complexity and performance uh, depends on available input data. So in this study, we decided to use both techniques, so-called dual approach, uh, to take advantage of uh, both of them. Um, so we used both of those techniques to isolate and quantify uh, the role of shrinking glaciers in uh, recent and upcoming changes in uh, southwestern Yukon. And we're going to do it by first disentangling glacier-related from non-glacier-related changes, and then positioning uh, glaciers watersheds in relation to the peak water. So peak water is this conceptual uh, breakpoint uh, that is used to um, illustrate the long-term evolution of discharge in glacier catchments. So we have uh, initial increase in discharge following the enhanced melt uh, due to increased temperatures. Uh, then we reach this uh, plateau called peak water and then discharge in the watershed starts decreasing because um, glaciers retreat so much, uh, so they're simply not able to produce a lot of water anymore. Uh, and we applied this approach for eight watersheds in southwestern Nikon uh, with different glacier covers. So we have two highly glacierized watersheds uh, that uh, are one, one third of uh, which are covered by glaciers. We also have watersheds with 9% glacierized, uh, several watersheds with a smaller glacier cover from 0.5 to 3%, and also a couple of watersheds with uh, no glaciers at all. Um, and this region is particularly interesting, we thought, because uh, to the south of Yukon in British Columbia, um, watersheds seem to have passed uh, peak water already, uh, whereas in uh, Yukon, uh, some studies, at least on the larger watershed, watersheds, uh, show that uh, peak water is still coming. So here's a 
a little bit more elaborated uh, methodology for this uh, study. So as I said, first part is consisted of um, historical data analysis. So we performed trend detection in hydrometeorological time series, where, for example, from uh, discharge time series, we extracted uh, variables um, illustrating uh, changes in magnitude of flow, flow variability, and timing of certain hydrological events. And then we perform trend attribution based on hydrological regimes. So those were calculated based on a monthly fraction of annual uh, runoff. So basically, uh, depending on your, uh, illustrating the shape of your uh, yearly hydrograph. And so results of trend detection were compared between different regimes. Uh, second part, uh, for the second part, we needed uh, measured changes in um, glaciers area. So we used Landsat images to derive uh, those changes and we were able to extract um, glaciers areas for all the watersheds for 1989, uh, 98 and 2017, which gives us uh, 20 years, 28 years of changes. And we used those uh, um, to perform model-based peak water analysis. And I'm gonna spend just a little bit more time on this last point. So this model-based peak water analysis uses a simple water balance model which is based on a water budget. Uh, and it uses watershed area, initial glacier surface, and annual ice loss rate as an input. Those last two are derived from uh, our glacier inventory. Thus, it helps us to avoid the uncertainties that stem from a modeling uh, glacier response to the climate change. And we just uh, directly take the measured glacier response. Also, most of the parameters of this model are either taken from the literature or derived from glacier inventory. Uh, which makes it possible to use in uh, data scarce regions. To account for uncertainties in our glacier area delineation, uh, which using the error calculated, uh, we, we used five values of annual ice loss rate. And to account for uncertainties in uh, area volume scaling, because what we measure is the change uh, in the area, but what we need is actually changing the volume available for melt. So we use three values for the scaling factor ranging from very conservative to very extreme. And this gives us uh, 15 different scenarios. For each of the scenario, the model uh, produces synthetic time series of um, yearly and ablation season discharge are in black and also coefficients of variations in yellow, as well as change in uh, glacier area. Then based on those time series, for each scenario, again, it allocates <coughs> big water phases so we have uh, pre peak water phase P1 when uh, discharge is increasing and flow variability uh, decreasing. We have pre peak water phase P2 when both discharge and flow variability increase. We reach peak water somewhere here. And then there is post peak water phase P3 when discharge start increasing and then flow variability keeps uh, increasing. And post peak water phase P4 when uh, glaciers no longer influence runoff and both of those var variables are somewhat leveling out. So that brings me to the results. Oh no, not yet. Uh, also to quantify the upcoming changes, um, we calculated for each scenario a relative peak water discharge um, in comparison to current levels and also relative post peak water discharge. Now the results. So this is a trend detection attribution uh, in historical uh, data. So we were able to identify three hydrological regimes. So we have uh, watersheds that are dominated by snowmelt runoff. So they have their peak early in the season following the snowmelt. We have watersheds that are dominated by glacier runoff. They peak later in the season following glacier melt peak. And also we were able to identify uh, watersheds that are dominated by lake runoff. And due to the regularly uh, role of lakes, uh, their discharge is somewhat better balanced throughout the year. And here, I just wanna draw your attention quickly to the fact that Glacier watersheds uh, can also cluster either with snowmelt runoff or with lake regime, like these two here, which means that when we just compare um, glacier rest versus non glacier rest watersheds, we might, we might simplify the, the situation a little bit. So, when we compare uh, detected trends, we saw that uh, discharge increase and flow variability decreases in uh, highly glacier rest catchments, which indicates pre peak water phase. And that other um, hydrological changes in either other hydrological variables are non uh, region specific. In particular, we saw increases in winter discharge, changes in the timing of ablation season start, and also peak flow. Here's the results of peak water analysis. Uh, here, the 
watersheds are arranged so that glaciers cover decrease from left to right. And for each watershed, uh, this is the number of scenarios that allocated one or another peak water phases. Here there for the reference. And on top, I'm just gonna put the one that was voted for by the majority of scenarios. So we see that the, for two most glaciers watersheds, uh, the majority of scenarios allocated pre-peak water phase P1, which is consistent with the results uh, of trend detection in uh, discharge variables. And other glacier watersheds seem to have passed peak water according to all the scenarios. And then uh, other uh, watersheds with a smaller glacier cover are either in the pre-peak water phase or post-peak water phase. So overall, peak water phase does not depend or does not seem to depend on uh, glacier uh, cover or hydrological regime. And uh, peak water analysis results are consistent with the results of trend analysis, which gives us quite a confidence in them. Uh, unlike peak water phase, the relative peak water and post-peak water discharges seem to be related to glacier uh, cover. So if we look here, this is a relative peak water discharge. So in comparison with uh, current levels, uh, two most glacierized watersheds will experience from 20 to 50% increase on average. Whereas even though some of these watersheds are still heading towards peak water, the changes is not gonna be very big. Similarly for post-peak water drop, in comparison with current levels, the most glacier catchment will uh, experience the decrease in discharge from 50 to 80 percent. And again, uh, other watersheds are, are not going to have such a drastic change. So that brings me to uh, conclusions. So we saw that changes in ablation season and yearly discharges, as well as flow variability, are related to the presence of glaciers in watersheds, whereas uh, increase in winter runoff and changes in timing of uh, certain hydrological events are not really related uh, to glaciers. Two most glacierized watersheds have not passed peak water yet, and uh, their discharge is projected uh, to increase and decline significantly, up to 80%, as we saw. Uh, another glacierized watershed is apparently now in a post peak water phase, um, which is interesting because uh, one and a half decades ago, it was still heading towards peak water, so the change is relatively recent. And finally, uh, results are consistent uh, across two independent methodologies, historical data analysis and process simulation, which gives us a great confidence in these uh, results. So on this, I'm done and I'm happy to answer your questions. And if you want some more details, you can check out our papers. And this is the image of the Duke watershed uh, that have passed the quarter recently. Excellent, thank you, Anna. Um, I'm, I, I'd like to take the first question, actually. Um, I'm just wondering if your analysis was based purely on streamflow observations or whether you had any direct uh, measurements of um, glacier loss or snow melt or even rainfall that came into it. Um, so uh, the glacier response was integrated by uh, measuring the change in glacier area for the last few decades. The, that's what we feed into the peak water model. And that's how we derive the, uh, I, uh, the ice loss rate, basically, that is needed for the model. We did not account for uh, changes in um, snow cover in, in the region. So this is really just the link between glacier response, uh, glacier retreat, sorry, and the changes. Okay. I, I think the thing that struck me was when, when you showed those hydrographs, I was just wondering, have you, are you sure there's no rainfall, rainfall response in those, in those signals? So the, uh, the areas is very dry. This is, uh, we talk about the subarctic that is on the rain shadow of St. Elias Mountains. So, I mean, of course, there are some rainfall events during the, um, the summer, but they're uh, based on those hydrographs, they're not really the dominant effect, it seems. But so those are derived from the measured uh, discharge time series. So this is really how they clustered uh, in those three groups. Uh, yeah. So it seems like uh, rainfall is not really the dominant driver in the region. Okay. That is during the summer. Yeah. So okay, thank you. There's another question from Nicholas Kinar. Hi, Anna. Thanks for your pertinent talk. Have you conducted a sensitivity analysis for the model? And could you comment on how parameter choices affect discharge and results? Um, we did not uh, make a sensitivity analysis, but what we did uh, is we performed, and I'm going to get there, two uh, additional uh, simulations uh, 
one was uh, this one, because what we used is the glacier retreat rate uh, derived for these 28 years of um, glacier inventory that we did. And we assumed simply due to the lack of data that um, the glacier retreat will accelerate with the same rate, which is not necessarily uh, true. So we might have underestimated this, but what we, we did, we conducted uh, simulations where we used the rapid retreat uh, factor, which is uh, a magnitude larger than what we derived to see if, um, if those derived trends might still change. And it seems that two uh, highly glacier watersheds are quite sensitive to this um, ice loss rate acceleration factor. So let's say if uh, glacier retreat is to accelerate significantly, we might still uh, prolong the peak water phase and actually uh, have a larger increase in discharge and then larger drop. But this is uh, like, uh, with, this is how we try to account for our uh, assumptions. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, Nicholas says thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Anna. So we'll move on okay. to our next speaker, uh, which is um, Wafa. And Wafa, if you wouldn't mind just telling me how to pronounce your name properly, that would be Wafa great. Shu'aib. Wafa Shu'aib. Shu'aib. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, hello everyone and thank you for having me. So this presentation is about the analysis of low flow conditions in terms of disparities in magnitude, duration and frequencies across Canada rivers. So the main uh, accurate research, research motivations of this study is um, the, uh, the impact that low flows are having on the water supply and the, the, the reservoir operations and the, the health of fish and fish habitats and in general, the social economic development across um, rivers of Canada. Uh, so uh, in this study, we used 167 catchments from the Water Survey of Canada, and we used the data set of reference um, hydrometric basin network uh, that provides uh, data of natural flow. Um, the, um, the record length of uh, the flow data on average in all of the study catchments is around 50 years. So most of the study catchments are having uh, flow records between 31 and 60 years. Um, so in, my, in the analysis of low flow conditions, basically uh, to tease out uh, uh, differences in magnitude, seasonality, and duration, we use the stochastic framework. And when I say stochastic framework, we were analyzing, analyzing the multi flow duration curve uh, in each of the steady catchments, and we focus on the lower tail of the uh, of the multi flow duration curve, and uh, particularly on three quantiles: the Q70, Q80, and Q90. So here, um, among the three quantiles, we were looking for a cutoff value that best describes the low flow periods across each of the steady catchments in terms of uh, um, characteristics of uh, magnitude, duration, and uh, seasonality. So the Q90 leads only to one period, uh, to one month of low flow uh, period. The Q70 was too high actually to, um, to describe uh, low flow periods. However, the Q80 flow quantile was the cutoff value that uh, was able to catch two different periods of low flows across most of the study catchments. So the Q80 was the uh, actually criteria to describe low flow periods. And the, the um, mapping of Q80 um, showed a large variability um, across the study catchments, Q80 in millimeter per month range between 0 uh, 0.3 millimeter per month up to 98 millimeter per month. And according to results from Q80, we see that the, the least severe low flow conditions are observed in the east and the west coasts. Um, the moderate uh, low flow conditions are observed in southern Quebec and uh, uh, southern Ontario uh, and uh, in interior BC in the surroundings of the Fraser River uh, and the most severe low flow conditions are observed in the prairies and the, the um, northern provinces. Uh, in our analysis of the seasonality and duration, we use the a binary matrix for each of the provinces. And here is an example from the province of Ontario. If you look at this catchment, for instance, um, we analyzed month to month with 
the monthly flow conditions. So if we are at monthly flow conditions that are lower or equal than Q80, so it's a one, uh, like here, for instance, for January, February, and March, if we are at monthly flow conditions that are higher than Q80, so it's a zero. So here we see that uh, it, for the rest of the year, it's zero everywhere. Uh, summing up these ones uh, in this row, we can obtain an assessment of the duration of the low flow season in this particular catchment. If we look at this matrix um, in, in terms of columns and uh, month to month uh, as well, uh, for instance, for the month of January here, for this catchment, we are at, flow, uh, at low flow conditions that are lower than Q80, and we can count the number of the catchments where uh, we are at Severe low flow conditions. So summing up these ones, we can obtain here eight catchments out of a total of 19 catchments that are experiencing severe low flow conditions, leading to a percentage of 32%. So uh, these percentage here are giving us a bigger picture of the seasonality of the low flow con uh, conditions across the province of Ontario. So according to these percentage, we can see clearly that the two main seasons of low flow periods are the winter time and the summer time. Uh, back to the duration here, if uh, calculating the duration at each, at each of these catchments uh, and averaging um, the, the column over here, we can obtain one representative value of the low flow uh, season across the province of Ontario, for instance, which is equal to 2.89. So we conducted this um, analysis in each of the provinces and the results are summarized in these histograms. So the shortest duration of low flow period was observed in the provinces of Newfoundland and New Brunswick, uh, equal to 2.6 months. 18% uh, of the catchments in Newfoundland are having two seasons of low flows. 53% uh, of the catchments in New Brunswick are having two seasons. So when I say two seasons, it means winter and summer. Um, in the provinces of Ontario, Quebec, BC, uh, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward, and Alberta, this uh, duration of low flows um, getting even larger and is equal to three months. Um, in Ontario, 21% uh, of the catchments are having two seasons of low flows. In Quebec, 11% uh, of the catchments are having two seasons. In BC, 10% of the steady catchments are having two seasons. In Nova Scotia and Prince Edward, mainly it's one season, which is the summer. In Alberta, it's one season as well, but it's uh, during the winter time. So getting um, to the prairies and uh, the northern provinces, the duration of low flow period is getting even uh, uh, longer, uh, equal to 3.5 months for Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and uh, Northwest Territories. We see that the uh, low flow period uh, is extending uh, to, the, uh, to the month of May. And, it's, uh, and the low flow uh, actually season is getting even uh, longer, equal to four months in Nunavut and, uh, uh, and Yukon. Uh, in our analysis of the low flow frequency, actually we we are doing um, we did a low flow frequency analysis given their um, their in their indication about the environmental flow levels and the water quality dilution criteria. So to conduct low flow frequency analysis, uh, we use three time series. Uh, the one day minimum, the seven day minimum, and the 14 day minimum. So when I say seven day minimum, uh, it's a time series that is obtained um, uh, using a seven days moving average. The 14 day minimum uh, is a time series that is obtained using a 14 days uh, moving average. And this actually, according to the literature, we fitted a uh, weighable three parameter distribution to each of the time series. And uh, the best fit was obtained by maximizing the log likelihood function. And the results of the fit uh, were a good performance actually uh, in most of the study catchment. And this is an example of the fit of the three time series from the St. John River. Um, during the fit, we picked up mainly two, um, two flows uh, with two different uh, uh, return periods, the Q2 and the Q10. So the Q2, why the Q2 and the Q10 actually uh, related to the Q2, um, because it uh, gives us indica indication about the environmental flow uh, levels and also uh, the Q10, uh, because it gives uh, uh, an indication about the dilution criteria within the river. So we picked uh, up these two particular flows with these two return period uh, to have a sort of an assessment of environmental flow and dilution criteria. Um, let's go back a little bit to the theory. Actually, um, um, according to the tenant method in 1976, uh, we can have a, a relationship between the width and the, the flow magnitude for a specific uh, uh, return period expressed in terms of the mean annual flow. So if we are at um, 
10% of mean annual flow, the river is severely degraded. If we are in conditions of the flow between 10% and 30% mean annual flow, we are at fair conditions of, uh, of the flow. And uh, if we are in between 30% and 60% of mean annual flow, we are in good conditions of uh, the flow. So um, the results across the study catchments and across the provinces show the following. For the Q2, which is an indicator about the environmental flow, in particular the 7Q2, uh, which is obtained from the seven-day uh, minimum time series, um, we obtained uh, the following pattern. So uh, in Saskatchewan and Nunavut, in the three time series, the one-day minimum, the seven-day minimum, and the 14-day minimum, we obtained a median that is higher than the 20% mean annual flow. However, for the rest of the provinces, it's either equal uh, to 20% mean annual flow or lower. Means that uh, we should use the 7Q2 uh, with caution for the for uh, for these provinces. Um, however, in Saskatchewan and Nunavut, we can use the 7Q2 as the criteria of environmental flow um, because uh, it, um, it, is, it is not really uh, leading to severely degraded conditions. But for the rest of the provinces, um, we should be really careful because we may uh, have degraded conditions of, uh, uh, of the flow. For the Q10, it's also the same pattern. Um, we obtained uh, median values for Saskatchewan and Nunavut that are either equal or higher than 20% uh, mean annual flow for the three time series, the one day minimum, the seven day minimum, and the 14 day minimum. According to the literature, the 7Q10 is intensively used as a criteria for what we call it in dilution. Um, uh, so according to the results we obtained in Saskatchewan and Nunavut, we may use the 7Q10 as a criteria for water quality dilution. However, in the rest of the provinces, this may lead to degraded uh, conditions of the flow. Because we are always interested in having some predictions of the low flow frequency, particularly in uh, conditions of engaged catchments, we thought about actually um, conducting predictions of uh, several low flow frequencies, particularly Q1, Q2, Q5, and Q10, using uh, the catchment area and uh, by fitting a power law function. So the results um, across Canada um, show the following, and um, here I'm going to use the regionalization based on the climatic uh, characteristics um, that uh, give us uh, um, um, six, or, uh, six regions um, that are uh, geographically contiguous. So in the region uh, of the Arctic, we obtained um, a good fit where the R square uh, changed between 076 and 089 for the several flow and uh, return periods. For the region of the shield that is extending from the northern uh, prairies until uh, down to Quebec and Ontario, we uh, obtained a low R square means that uh, the area uh, of the catchment uh, on its own could not be uh, really a good predictor of uh, these low flow frequencies. In the rest of the regions, the mountain region in BC, particularly uh, in the Atlantic region and in the southern Ontario, we obtained good uh, R-square values. So this leads us to, to uh, conclude that the area could be a good indicator of the several uh, low flow frequencies, the Q1, Q2, Q5, and Q10. Um, thank you so much for your attention, and I'll be glad to hear your questions. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please um, put them in the box now. I'd, just a quick question. Um, I, I wonder whether you included within your analysis um, ephemeral streams, because, for example, here in Saskatchewan, most well, not most, many of the rivers um, are dry for most of the year and they only flow during snowmelt periods. So I'm not sure what that would do to your analysis. So would you please repeat, because here I'm trying to um... Yes, the, sorry. Now I can, I can go back to the, yeah. What was your question again, sorry? My, my question was, if you, did you include streams that go dry every year in your analysis? Like you intermittent flows? Yes, that's right. Yes, of course. Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, most of the uh, steady catchments in Saskatchewan, for instance, Alberta, Manitoba, and uh, part of the steady catchments in the, uh, in the north, they had intermittent uh, uh, zero flows. For some periods of the year. Okay. Okay, and so. Okay, does that? Do, do, what's the significance of your of your findings then for for rivers like that? 
So here, uh, the, the main um, the main conclusion is that we should be really careful in uh, setting up uh, levels of environmental flow um, um, and uh, what, like in terms of uh, the use of water, we should not be really excessive in terms of water withdrawal. That's one of the things. Uh, and we should be really careful in terms of um, uh, the, the fish habitat um, and uh, I mean, in the water quality. So. That, that was the main, actually, um, let's say, alerting uh, result. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. Is there any other um, questions at this point? If not, um, thank you very much, Wafa. We'll carry You're on. You're welcome. Next speaker. So I'd like to invite um, Dikra. Yes. Hello. Hello. So, would you like to one second? Share my screen. Please quickly introduce yourself as well. Uh, yeah. So, um, so just. I'm sorry. I cannot do two things at the same time. Okay. So, um, and um, I don't know if you can see uh, something. Yes. I can see myself. Um, yeah, yeah, your screen is shared, yes. Okay, great. So, um, uh, my name is uh, Dikra, and uh, I am um, a postdoc at ECCC um, based at Montreal. So, um, so today, you uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. So, today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, the um, a project that is running pre-operationally at uh, ECCC, look at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is the high resolution ensemble precipitation analysis. Uh, so some of you may uh, already know the Canadian precipitation analysis. So it's the gridded precipitation product developed uh, at ECCC, uh, which is uh, obtained uh, through optimal combination of surface observation from radar and uh, NWP forecast in order to provide the six hour and 24 hour um, precipitation analysis and that are available at uh, synoptic hours. So at zero, uh, six, 12 and 18 uh, ETC. So it's uh, a deterministic uh, uh, precipitation uh, product, uh, but um, uh, so as it is deterministic, we only have only one uh, member uh, only one uh, precipitation field but uh, today uh, the inc there is an increasing demand and uh, that is where the atripa the, the ensemble precipitation analysis comes in so atripa is a product based on kappa and uh, it is developed for uh, two uh, major needs so first it was developed as we needed here at uh, ecc for uh, another product, which is the Canadian Land Data Assimilation System. And this system needs ensemble precipitation. And uh, also this system is, a, is a, of high importance for many other systems here. For example, when we do hydrology uh, modeling, we use uh, the runoff from, uh, from CALDAS. For agriculture also it's important. And even for the forecast, the CALDAS Need to uh, give the uh, the its output, so it's a very important component to develop. But of course, there is also the the aim to provide uh, for the scientific community such product in order to allow for uncertainty assessment through an ensemble of precipitation. So, how is designed the uh, a this ensemble? So, uh, the first thing uh, that was done in order to um, to develop this product, uh, it was to identify the main sources of uncertainties in the precipitation analysis so that we can uh, provide um, an ensemble that take uh, into account those uncertainties. So the first part is the background field or the, uh, the forecast given by the, the numerical weather prediction system, the NWPs, who give, gives us a field uh, of precipitation uh, like that. And uh, we do perturb this field uh, along the, la long the latitude and the longitude 
so that uh, this perturbation follow a normal distribution with zero mean and with a displacement, like an error displacement of 25 kilometer. And we do that 24 times so that we perturb, we, we have 24 uh, perturbed background shifts. Uh, the second sources of, uh, of uh, uncertainty in the precipitation analysis of kappa is uh, one, uh, one observation input, the, the radar. So here we have uh, the radar precipitation for a given time step, and we have the radar beam here of precipitation. And in order to account for the uncertainty uh, in this precip precipitation, we add uh, a random noise in, the, in, in this radar beam, and this, rand uh, this random noise follow a normal distribution with a zero mean and the error, the variance of this um, random node uh, has a variance of radar observation errors. And I cannot explain how this variance is, uh, is obtained, but it's important to know that this variance is, um, is evolving with time. So each, at each analysis time step, we have a different errors in uh, the radar. And we do that 24 times, and we get 24 uh, radar mosaics to be, uh, uh, which, which are available as an input for the precipitation analysis. And the third part that contains uh, a certainty are, uh, is, the, um, uh, is the surface station. So we have all, all the stations that we use for, for the precipitation analysis. And uh, we, uh, so that we can account for the uncertainty, we add the random noise for each station independently for each analysis time step. And this random noise follow again the normal distribution uh, centered around zero with a given variance of observation errors. And here again, it's updated at each assimilation time step. And we generate 24 times uh, 24 precipitation networks. So we have all our inputs perturbed so that we have the uncertainty associated uh, to those uh, inputs. And we do 24 times like in Kappa, the optimal interpolation, and we get the, the HREPA, which is the ensemble precipitation analysis. And this uh, analysis, uh, this product, uh, HREPA, uh, was evaluated uh, across two time periods. So during uh, one summer, uh, 2018, and uh, one winter, 2018, 2019. Uh, here, I'm gonna present you the results for the six hour precipitation accumulation using 24 members and a control member. A control member is the one that was not perturbed. It's equivalent to the, to the kappa over a grid uh, of 2.5 kilometer uh, resolution. So we, ha we are here in the context of very high resolution. And the verification that I will I'm gonna show you the, the results are um, was made on the sign up station, which are the most re reliable stations um, that we use, and in a leave one out uh, approach. So it is in a validation uh, approach. We want to see how the prediction power of um, of the the ensemble. So the first result uh, is the attribute diagram. So maybe some of you may know uh, such diagrams, but uh, some of you may not. So I'm gonna present briefly uh, these diagrams. So uh, th those that diagrams are uh, very useful when we evaluate uh, ensembles, uh, precipitation or, te or temperature, and uh, they have the advantage to summarize different quality attributes of an ensemble. We want to see that our ensemble is reliable, they have resolution and sharpness. But today, as we have only 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to just focus on the reliability of the ensemble. It is the most important, um, the most important quality attribute of an ensemble. So here, uh, it's the result for the summer uh, season and uh, for different precipitation thresholds. So we have the precipitation above 0 0.2 millimeter, above one and above three uh, millimeter. And on the X axis, we have the forecast probability which is given by the ensemble. And on the Y axis, we have the associated observed relative frequency. And here, for example, uh, we want that, um, so that we can say that our ensemble is reliable, we want that this curve follow the diagonal line. Because, uh, for example, when the, uh, the ensemble uh, tells that uh, for the precipitation above 0 0.2 millimeter, I predict uh, a 0 0.5 probability, but when we look at the observation, we saw that this probability is actually less than that. So our ensemble is too confident when predicting those probabilities. So here, for example, as I said, for the, for the, the small precipitation, the ensemble may be a little bit too confident. 
uh, giving higher precipitation value than that was observed. But as we increase the precipitation, then, uh, we're, we're, then we move away from the very small precipitation, we see that we can increase the reliability of uh, the ensemble. When we look at the winter, we have a slightly different pattern as we have a, a higher reli reliability for the small precipitation. As we can see here, we are very close to the the diagonal for the for the 0 0.2 and 1 millimeter. But as we move away uh, from uh, that uh, threshold, we can see that we have the inverse uh, uh, behavior than in summer. We have the the ensemble here um, uh, predict too uh, low value compared to what was observed uh, in the in the station. And, uh, and another uh, score that is uh, interesting to, to look at when we uh, want to evaluate the precipitation and ensemble is the Breyer scale score. So the Breyer score uh, is equivalent to the mean squared error, the classical MSC, but for the ensemble. And we are used to uh, not evaluate directly the Breyer, the Breyer score, but the Breyer scale score, which is um, a normalized version of the Breyer score. And here we normalize the, the Breyer score by the climatology. And we want to see uh, does our ensemble is more skillful than the climatology. And of course we want that. Otherwise we only take the climatology. So here uh, are, is the, um, the result for the whole domain for different precipitation thresholds. So we can see uh, here the value in percentile, but here in millimeter. So we're increasing it up to, 20, up to 26 uh, millimeter and the BSS value. So we can say that our um, our ensemble is more skillful, skillful than the climatology when it's above zero here and a perfect value is one for the summer uh, in uh, this line here and in the dashed line for the winter. And we can see that as we increase we move away from the small precipitation. Uh, we have uh, we have a higher performances in the ensemble, and then a decrease for high precipitation. We also can see that the summer, um, the the winter uh, has better performances, has more skill than uh, than the summer. But it is something expected because the the A tripper, which is based on the the forecast. Uh, and the forecast is known to have better skill in predicting uh, the large scale precipitation occurring during during winter than the small scale uh, convective precipitation occurring during the summer. So it is something uh, expected. So uh, to conclude, uh, so it was a very very brief overview. There are many many other results, but uh, we can we can uh, we can conclude that during the summer the one uh, limitation is the very light precipitation and the very high precipitation. We have like a loss of performances. But here, I co the comparison is made, uh, is made against uh, surface observation, which are, which are point um, precipitation observed at a very uh, small area. Uh, and um, the a tripper, which is a gridded precipitation, is available on a surface uh, precipitation, so a 2.5 uh, uh, and a 2.5 grid cell. So we are not comparing exactly the same thing. So there is something happening maybe here that explains those differences, but other things also. But generally we can say that they were a low bias. The, generally the ensemble is reliable and uh, we observed a high skill for many events. During winter, like I said just before, the, the skill was higher during the summer and uh, we observed also reliability for uh, many uh, precipitation events. But there is still a lot of room for improvement as it is uh, this ensemble is running pre-operationally, so it's not uh, open to the public yet. And uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are doing some research now so we can improve this ensemble by using um, different types of uh, forecasts because as I presented, the um, uh, in the in the how the a tripper was designed is that uh, this ensemble is generated um, st statistically and the idea now is to use ensemble that are generated dynamically so we can have a different type of error more complex uh, across, uh, and that can depend on the regions and the seasons etc so uh, that's what I have to say so I'll be pleased to answer questions about uh, about that. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I encourage anybody to ask questions. We're doing really quite well for time at the moment. So here's a question from Nicholas. Hi, Dikra, thanks for the talk. Why do you want to add random perturbations? Is this similar to pre-whitening in signal processing to make the data have similar statistical similarities to white noise? Mm. Uh, so uh, we add the random perturbation so that we can, so it, we want to, um, to, um, to, to mimic the uncertainty. So, uh, so we add a, a random node and uh, so that the error are nil, but uh, they're not completely, uh, actually, yeah. they are not completely, they are random because uh, we are picking from a normal distribution, but the error, the variance of the error corresponds to the, to the one associated to the to one data set. So uh, they, we have different errors for the, the background, for the for the surface station, for the, the radar, and uh, we suppose that those errors represent the, um, the the uncertainty that we have on those uh, on those products. And I'm not familiar familiar with the pre whitening in signal processing, so I cannot answer to that part of the question. But for adding, yeah. I think random perturbation is like classically done when we want to generate ensembles. Okay. Um, I was wondering, have you compared this product with Kappa? Uh, with Kappa, you mean? Yes. Um, uh, so Kappa is uh, is like one member of the H Repa actually. It's like a side uh, a side product. When I talked about the control member, the control member is Kappa. So it's the deterministic one. And we want to have like a, a perturbed uh, a version of that. And we have this new product, which is a tripper. And the idea is to have the uncertainty of Kappa by using uh, a tripper. For example, if you want to use uh, if you have um, like an when we use to, when you want to use for hydrology and modeling and you use uh, kappa but you know that there are some errors uh, in the misplacement of the precipitation event you can run 24 times your model and you can have like the the, the, the central value the control value and you have an error around the value so okay. you cannot compare it to kappa i see i, I see so when you were showing your your the skill of your product, we you were comparing it with Kappa, were you? Uh, I'm comparing to to a surface station. Oh, so okay. uh, for each grid cell, I'm comparing the precipitation of the Kappa or a Tripa grid cell to the 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 closest station, and that station was not was not used uh, in the in the assimilation process. So it's an independent station. That's the the point with the leave one out approach, that's uh, the idea. Okay, I see. Um, so just finally, is is this product um, available for people to experiment with? Uh, not, not yet. So uh, it's, uh, it, um, it is running pre-operationally, so it means it's not uh, already operational. Uh, because um, we wanted to, it's, it's running since uh, April this year, and it has it has to be uh, run uh, like uh, at least uh, one year to see that there is no bug, no no things happening, popping, and everything, and then uh, this product will be uh, will be available for the for the community. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, then, Dikra. So, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our final speaker um, of the day, which is uh, Jason Leach from the Canadian Forest Service, um, talking about headwater lakes and their influence on stream temperature. Are you? Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, all right, that looks good from your end, I hope. Yes. Great, wonderful. Yeah, so as Andrew mentioned, uh, you. Okay, uh, as Andrew mentioned, my name's uh, Jason Leach. I'm a research hydrologist with the Canadian Forest Service, and I'm going to share with you a, a little study looking at headwater lakes and their influence on stream temperature. 
This work was done in collaboration with Beth Nielsen and Caleb Buahan at Utah State University, as well as Dan Moore at UBC and Yelmar Loudon at SLU uh, in Sweden. So why do we care about stream temperature? Well, uh, there are, uh, whoops, yeah, uh, why do we care about stream temperature? Well, stream temperature has been referred to as the master variable of aquatic ecosystems. Um, it controls a whole slew of, of physical, biological, and chemical processes in the stream environment. And so um, there's concerns that with climate change, as well as land cover changes, such as forest harvesting, wildfire, urbanization, that these environmental changes are gonna alter the, the water temperature of our streams and rivers and in turn have impacts on aquatic organisms. In particular, there's widespread concern over cold water species such as trout and salmon. So what we need is a, a good understanding of how these environmental changes impact stream temperature um, because a better understanding will allow us to design more effective management approaches to, to maintain and, and sustain these healthy aquatic ecosystems. So we've been doing this sort of stuff, uh, this process-based stream temperature stuff for, for over 50 years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and we've made some huge, huge progresses in a lot of ways, um, but there's some key, res key gaps that, that are still outstanding. And, and one glaring gap is uh, when we start scaling up to network scales, the role of these small lakes um, and their influence on, on downstream temperature. So here's an image, for example, this is taken from Sweden, uh, where you see a number of small lakes dotting the landscape uh, and, and, and throughout. And, and this, is, this is very common for a lot of northern glaciated environments. A lot of Canada has the same sort of feature, features, a lot of small lakes uh, distributed, uh, you know, millions and millions of these small lakes distributed throughout the landscape. So a real critical question is, uh, as I mentioned, what influence do these lakes have on downstream temperature and overall uh, surface water network thermal regimes. So our study uh, is trying to start to address this and, and the two key research objectives of this, of this work are uh, what controls stream temperature below a headwater lake and the second research objective, how does the lake influence on downstream temperature vary through time? So the study was conducted at a lake stream network or lake stream system in uh, Northern Sweden at the Crickling Catchment Study. Uh, the top image there gives you a, a little mini panorama of the Headwater Lake. It's got a surface area of about five hectares. The map below that gives you a sense of the, the outlet uh, stream as it flows uh, down and some of the instrumentation we had installed during the study period. Uh, so some of the key instrumentation include hydrometric stations, uh, both one just below the stream outlet at C5 here, and another one about 1.4 kilometers downstream at the C6 location. In addition, the red dots indicate uh, two weather stations that were installed during the study period uh, that were aimed to characterize the above stream microclimate conditions. The X's indicate locations where there are stream temperature sensors were installed in the stream. And then finally, the blue triangles indicate locations where there were arrays of soil temperature measurements uh, installed in the riparian zone. And as you can see, there's five locations here, and these weren't just picked randomly. These were uh, uh, chosen based on prior knowledge of preferential inflow locations from the hill slope um, and to, to really ca uh, uh, capture those, those water inputs to the temperature of those water inputs. So just to summarize here some of the field measurements, I want to just highlight a couple other sort of key pieces. One is hemispherical images. You can see an example here on the right. So about 111 photos were taken throughout the, the stream reach, and these were used to quantify variability in riparian canopy, and as well used within a net radiation model to allow us to model net radiation on the stream surface. Another key point that I alluded to in the previous slide was the fact that uh, we had conducted previous work on this stream reach using detailed temperature tracing and, and uh, water isotope data to help us identify the location and magnitude of key lateral inflows along the stream reach. And because of that prior work um, was done, it allowed us to do a pretty good job of constraining these estimates for our, our study. Um, which we typically don't have this sort of information when we, when we do these reach scale stream temperature uh, assessments. And because of that, it did allow us, as I mentioned previously, that, that we could really target our, our measurements of lateral inflow temperatures coming into the stream reach. 
Blue's field data were used within a stream temperature model. The, the modeling platform we used is called HydroCouple. This is uh, a software developed by Beth and Caleb and some other colleagues at the Utah State uh, University. Um, some really nice, uh, nice little piece of software to use. It implements, in terms of the stream temperature work, implements uh, Beth's reach scale uh, stream temperature model. And what I've included here is just a general uh, a diagram illustrating the, the key energy exchange influences on, on a stream reach. Uh, so you have your solar radiation, your long wave radiation, turbulent uh, energy exchanges, head heat conduction, as well as your upstream boundary condition, which is in our case, uh, the lake uh, provided this, hyperic exchange, lateral reduction associated with hill slope and shallow groundwater uh, runoff. And so what the stream temperature model allows us to do is take that upstream uh, boundary condition float water through, subject it to the various energy exchanges and see how we, uh, and then come up with a prediction of downstream temperature. And now we can compare that prediction of downstream temperature to actual observations. And that will give us an indication of how well we are doing at uh, simulating this sort of system. But to give you a sense of the stream temperature patterns along this study reach, um, we have uh, on the x-axis here, the, the uh, study period running from July into mid-October. And then this is hourly stream temperature data measured at the lake outlet, that's the C5 site in red, and then the 1.4 kilometer downstream location uh, in blue. And I think the key thing that really pops out from this is obviously that we have warm water throughout not just the key peak summer period, but into the fall as well. We have warm water discharging from that lake and that uh, water cools as it moves downstream. And in some cases that uh, cooling gradient is quite substantial. So for example, in late uh, July here, we have water coming out of the lake at uh, you know, 21, 22 degrees, and it's cooling about 10 degrees over the course of uh, this 1.4 kilometer reach, so quite substantial. And so the big question is, what are the processes driving that sort of observed cooling, these sorts of dynamics? And this is where we use the stream temperature model. And so first I'm gonna show you some of the uh, downstream predictions made by the stream temperature model in comparison to observation. So again, we're looking at the same study period here. In black is our observed hourly stream temperature data. Uh, this is the same from the, the previous graph. This is at the lower downstream location. And then in red, we have the modeled stream temperature data. And as you can see, this is in a band. So this is accounts for some of the uncertainty and variability, particularly in the lateral inflow temperature uh, uh, estimates. And what we see here, for the most part, we're doing a reasonable job of capturing the overall patterns of the downstream team, stream temperature. There are obviously periods where we have some over prediction, there's other periods where we have a bit of under prediction. Uh, but for the most part, um, we're doing, a, I think, a reasonable job of capturing uh, the patterns, which then allow us to use this model to start to diagnose what's sort of controlling these patterns. And that's what I'm showing here in this uh, plot. So this is, shows daily mean uh, reach average fluxes along the stream reach, again, over the course of the study period. And these um, are uh, categorized based on a few different sort of energy budget terms. So for example, in red is our net radiation. In black, we have the sum of a few different uh, energy fluxes occurring at the stream bed. So bed, con bed heat conduction, hyper exchange and friction. In gray, we have the sensible and latent heat fluxes. And then in our blue band here is the uh, heat flux associated with the lateral inflow. And the two key things I want you to draw from this is that net radiation for the most part, even during sort of peak summer periods, uh, is either very close to a zero flux or a negative flux. And this is really interesting. This contrasts quite a bit other uh, research or energy budget uh, work done in headwater uh, forests and headwater streams um, that don't have a headwater lake where this is often the, the main source of heat input into the stream. The other key thing to draw from this uh, image is that, uh, as you can see, the lateral inflows are really, really important for driving that downstream cooling, particularly during these sort of key runoff events um, and whatnot. Um, so those, those, are, those hydrologic controls are really, really important for the, the observed stream temperature patterns. So to the last little bit of analysis I want to show is, is then focusing on the lake influence and coming up with a, a way of estimating how influential the lake is on the downstream temperature and how far does that lake signal propagate. So just a, a little diagram to sort of help you conceptualize this. We have our lake and the water is discharging or, or outflowing from there. And as it flows down, it's being subjected to the various vertical fluxes as well as the hill slope inflow. 
And so what we did to sort of estimate a lake influence was run two model scenarios. Model one, which is using our baseline condition. So this is essentially the model uh, results that you saw in the last couple graphs. And then a second model where we make one small change to the um, uh, boundary condition. And that is we increase the lake outflow temperature by one degree. And we compare those two, the predictions made by those two models, take the predictions from model one or baseline, subtract it from our model two, and this gives us an idea of our lake influence. So that at any location along this stream through time, a value closer to one would indicate a strong lake influ influence, and a cloud, uh, uh, value closer to zero would indicate um, that that lake influence has been uh, essentially erased and, 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 and not seeing it anymore. So I'm going to show a few uh, uh, graphs here comparing different hydrological conditions, uh, and these are sort of snapshots in time. So the panels on the left show distance downstream of the lake, and then this lake influence uh, measure on the uh, y-axis. And at the same time, for reference, on the on the uh, panel on the right, we have a snapshot of the uh, dominant energy or the energy uh, balance terms at that time. So we'll start off with the first one on the top. This is a scenario where we have low lake outflow and low hill slope inflows or low lateral uh, discharge. And what you can see is unsurprising, near the lake, we have a relatively stronger lake influence. Um, but as we move downstream, uh, that, that lake influence gradually diminishes. And the energy balance uh, results suggest that that uh, er sort of erasing of the lake influence is primarily due to net radiation and hyperate exchange. We compare that to a scenario where we have low lake outflow, but high lateral inflow. So the hill slopes are, 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 are triggered here now. We have a lot of water coming off the hill slope. Overall, we see the same sort of pattern, right? We have a strong lake influence near the lake, but and as we get downstream, um, uh, that lake influence is diminished. But instead, uh, we have these step changes uh, occurring along the reach. And these are associated with preferential inflow locations. So in this case, and, and the energy balance uh, confirms this or, or highlights this, that it's really what's coming in from the hill slopes, that lateral advective flux that is really um, erasing that lake influence as we move downstream. Now we compare that with two scenarios where we have high lake outflow, uh, one where we also have high runoff from the hill slopes and another scenario where we have low runoff from the hill slopes. Um, and what we conclude from this is uh, it doesn't really matter. As long as that lake is pumping water down the stream, that lake influence um, is sustained, at least compared to, to these other scenarios, regardless of what sort of energy dynamics are occurring um, along that stream reach. So in conclusion, uh, I think some of the key results coming out of this are that the lake outflow and hill slope inflows uh, dictate the thermal regime of these, uh, of these sorts of streams, draining lakes. The lake influence on downstream temperature uh, varies in space and time as a function of lake outflow. So it's really a, a hydrologically driven system, at least in terms of the, the, the thermal regime. And finally, I think these results uh, start to suggest that small lakes and their influences on downstream temperature uh, should be incorporated into network scale modeling of aquatic thermal regimes. And with that, I thank you very much for sticking it out here on, uh, on uh, Friday and uh, I'll finish off there. Thanks, Jason. That was great. Um, so first question from Nicholas again. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah. Hi, Jason. How quickly do temperatures change upstream after downstream temperatures? Sorry, how quickly do temperatures change temperature changes upstream affect downstream temperatures? How quickly do temperature changes upstream? Oh, I see. Okay, that's a good question. So it, it so that's um, it, again, it sort of depends on the uh, the essentially the hydrologic setting. So for example, um, uh, when, there's, when there's a lot of water coming out of the lake, that, uh, that lake boundary condition will propagate downstream quite a ways. And then since the lake sort of acts as a really large solar panel for, for uh, you know, for, for a lot of the time, um, the, as the temperatures of that surface water in the lake fluctuates, we see those temperatures propagating downstream. In comparison, when that lake's not really activated as much, um, and it really becomes the reach scale uh, processes that are driving the temperature um, uh, patterns downstream, uh, it really varies. Um, so, for example, you might have you might um, see a, a rapid change in temperature associated with those preferential inflow locations. So, upstream, you might see 
uh, a certain temperature uh, pattern, but then uh, as you, as that uh, as you move downstream and 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 reach one of these preferential inflow locations, um, uh, you'll you'll see that upstream uh, temperature signal um, uh, disappearing to some extent, or minimized. I think would be a better way to phrase that. Okay. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions if that's okay. Um, sure. I, I was wondering if you measured the accretion of flow as you move downstream, like. Yeah, no, that's an that's an excellent. Um, so, uh, yes, yes, we did, uh, and and that's sort of part of the the work that I alluded to in the, the earlier work where we um, uh, use some uh, terrain indices, um, some very simple sort of terrain indices to estimate the the inflows. Um, but we also went out and collected uh, distributed uh, manual flow measurements at various locations um, through various time to confirm those estimates. So for the stream temperature modeling, we're using uh, essentially a, a sort of a distributed estimate based on the net change in discharge from the upstream location to the downstream. Um, but there are uh, fields, um, manual field measurements that, that suggest that's a reasonable approach. Okay. So you, you're really quite confident that the, the, the energy loss in that stream is due to these cold inflows that happen along the reach primarily. Yeah, it's it's really uh, it, you know to give you some context. Uh, um, uh, well, yeah, we're I think we're we're quite fairly confident. You know, as confident as you can with any of this stuff. <laughs> but yeah. uh, um, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence suggesting that's that's the case. Um, the uh, these are well shaded streams. Um, uh, so in terms of sort of a, you know, like an evaporative cooling or something like that, so the wind speeds are, are, are not terribly high within the canopy or, or under the canopy. Uh, so that sort of mechanism uh, likely isn't really critical. It, it is a, Northern Sweden's a very wet system. So the water table is very high um, and you get these really sort of, uh, uh, any sort of rain event, you get these really rapid runoff um, uh, responses. And there's a lot of water coming in along that stream reach. And, and so uh, I think it, it seems quite plausible that that's, that's the, um, the main mechanism of driving that downstream cooling, as, yeah. well as, as well as some localized hyperic exchange, which, which is sort of another beast in, uh, in itself. But, um, yeah. OK, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, I think I don't see any other questions. Um, so thank you to Jason and thank you to all of the speakers today. Uh, really great talks. Um, thank you to all the participants. Um, I, I, it's very strange that it's as all I can see is your names. I assume that you're behind the computer there listening and hopefully enjoying this, this talk. Um, join us for more of these um, in the coming weeks. And uh, in the meantime, have a, have a brilliant weekend. And I hope this, it's as sunny where you are as it is here in Saskatchewan. With that, thanks a lot and goodbye.